to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call. Roll call will reflect that all board members and cabinet are present except with the exception of Dr. Hyde. Approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of May 16th, 2023? So moved, Alvaro. Is there a second? Pierce? Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries 5-0. Board meeting agenda. Dr. May Vollmer, is there any addenda to tonight's agenda? Yes, there actually is. We will be pulling items 26.2 and 26.3 so that the board has greater time to review those items. Thank you. Approval of agenda. Is there, the board will be asked to take action on an assistant superintendent contract later during the meeting. I have an oral statement to read out. Government Code Section 53262 mandates that employment contracts for local agency executives be ratified in open session. In addition, California Government Code Section 54953C3 requires an oral summary of a recommendation for a final action on the salaries, salary schedules, and compensation to be paid in the form of fringe benefits to be paid to a local agency executive. Here is the oral summary for the proposed amendment to the employment agreement for the Assistant Superintendent of Personnel Services. The proposed amendment will extend the employment agreement through June 30th, 2026 with no other changes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of June 6, 2023? So moved, Alvarez. Is there a second? Second, Pierce. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. Community staff student recognition, Dr. May Vollmer. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd like to invite our public information officer, Mary Perry, to the podium. Good evening. You have to admit this is the best part of the whole board meeting, right? I mean, getting to say congratulations to so many people. So it was uh, quite a year for the stellar student athletes of Shadow Hills. And athletic director Mike Walsh, would you go, Mike? He asked if I would share some of the accomplishments of the Knights during the spring season. So first we have the baseball team. Any baseball players here with us? Come on up. Well, please. You're going to stand alone. <laughs> Mike, you want to come up here with them? So the 2023 20, baseball season was apparently memorable in many ways, and the Knights jumped to a 9-0 start in the DEL, ended up 11-4, 11-4, and they earned the first Desert Empire League title in Shadow Hills baseball history. They had an 11-2 first round playoff, followed by a 10-3 quarter final win, and it led to a heartbreaking 1-3 loss in the quarterfinals. But it's the furthest, furthest that the SHHS baseball has ever advanced in the playoffs. So if you would just take a little glance over there at another member of the comms team, Sean's gonna take a photo. He did, okay. So congratulations. <laughs> Mike, you might not want to sit down. When it comes to track and field, we're going to let the statistics speak for themselves, right? So congratulations to Michael Tambo, who is, where is he right now? He's in Cabo. Ah. So yeah, so he won't be here this evening, but you can see that his statistics are just so incredibly impressive. And we're also celebrating another first CIF champion in the history of Shadow Hills High School, and that's Marjorie Lopez. Is Marjorie here? So Marjorie is the CIF champion in the 
3,200 meter. Mike, you don't want to be up here with her? Come on. <laughs> Actually, Mike wrote all this, just so you know. <laughs> Congratulations, Marjorie. Wow. And we're also celebrating excellence in the first CIF individual champion in girls wrestling for Shadow Hills High School for Kaylin Montano. Kaylin, are you here? Well, hopefully she's <laughs> watching at home. So Kaylin, along with Jocelyn Sandoval and Isabel Navarro, have qualified for a national tournament through USA Wrestling, and it'll take place in Fargo, North Dakota. Kaylin is now ranked nationally and this will be Jocelyn and Isabel's first national tournament, and both will be back at Shadow next year. Are either of those uh, ladies here? Nope. All right. Well, according to Mike, it was definitely a great year to be a knight. I also have a shout out for the La Quinta High School Choir, but I don't see... Um, Miss McGuane here. I don't know, are any of the choir students here? Well, congratulations to them for um, taking first place in their division at a competition at Universal Studios. And they also wore, won the Esprit de Corps Award for Best Overall Spirit and Sportsmanship. And Sion Young, who played piano, won a medal for Best Overall High School Accompanist. So congratulations, Blackheart. I'm actually gonna veer off script for a minute. Sorry, Sean. Um, and I'm gonna call up um, Principal Derek Lawson, who'd like to make a few comments. And I promise to be brief. I even wrote it out because I wanna make sure I say this exactly right. Um, I'm here to represent and be here on behalf of all of our high school principals. And the reason is because we want to offer a public uh, expression of our appreciation and recognition for all of the various departments that went above and beyond to make, uh, to help and make our graduation so wonderfully successful. So often the public's not aware of all the outstanding work that's done behind the scenes. They see the principal on the stage, they see all the kids on the field, they see the staff sitting there that have taught for the last four years. They don't see everyone else that's behind the scenes and we really want to do some shout outs. Um, as our agent, where did, where we, uh, back here, our number two patrol person, Security agent number two behind Chief Nakur, Ryan Chandler, met with all of us to prepare our security plan, and he made this statement. Remember that this is the proudest moment for all of these parents and students, and let's do everything in our power to make sure that they know we are proud of their accomplishments. And so thank you, Ryan, for setting the stage for that because they actually did. With the various departments, first, security. I had zero issues in my event, and all of the principals said the same thing. I had a waiting list. I had more agents than I requested. A waiting list willing to work graduation, which is thrilling for us. We didn't have to beg, didn't have to plead, they were there. Each principal stated that our security team was proactive, cordial in enforcing the policies for safety and had tremendous and great customer support. Students and parents enjoyed six safe graduations. Grounds, maintenance, and operations, we can't say enough, over and above, they gave over and above time for field prep and in some cases some extra TLC for some areas that needed some touch up because we had athletic events with all the tremendous making it into CIF there at the end for some of our late e events in the spring. We needed some extra touch up and they did that. We had some touch up painting and some DG work to do in some of those areas and they did. They provided backup generators, sounds and lights and I had one at my particular school that came and took care of some things for timing on stadium lights and he said, here are some options that I created for you. You can let me know even within an hour of your ceremony which ones you want and I'll make it happen for you. Unheard of. Our tech team, our impact program at my school in Palm Desert, we have a lot of our senior, we have a, most of our interns are seniors and a lot of the kids coming up that can do the live streaming. We have a huge chunk that were seniors, a huge chunk of sophomores, but our juniors were a little bit smaller. Sean, did an outstanding job, worked with those kids, helped them be successful, gave extra time, they were set up, the extra personnel to ensure that all the live streaming was done, and extra sound checks, equipment, 
setting up early, running the checks, making sure that everything was ready so that all the performances by our kids for the bands and choirs that were involved could sound and look good and that our live streaming would work in spite of the unexpected last graduation weather with all the wind. Um, phenomenal job. Graphics. They were a model of flexibility, were accurate, had supreme customer service, and then at the last minute took care of reprints and overprints for some of the last minute additions, changes, and increases as we worked hard for some of those last few kids to cross that finish line. They did a remarkable job and never said, oh no, there's not enough time. It was like even the day of. Um, our fiscal and purchasing. As you are well aware, some of our local vendors, Costco and some of the places no longer are doing purchase orders in the same fashion. Things that we have done for years, and when it came time for some of the last minute things we needed for graduation, fiscal and purchasing said, okay, so we have a glitch, we will find a way, we will make it work, we'll help you take care of whatever we need to do to make it work, whether it's using a different card, uh, going to a different vendor, we will do what we have to do to make it work so everything can fall in place. Last but not least, nutrition services teams. Some of our graduations use nutrition services for the setup and of a reception for our dignitaries to feed our security team and our, our staff that's working the event because they leave one school at dismissal and have 15 minutes to get to the high school because they're gonna work the event so they don't have time to go home and change. Nutrition services set up and took care of all of that. All of that to say this, in all of the departments, Mr. Aquino, I wanna tell you thank you because when you first came, you said customer service is number one. Every division that worked with us at graduation, every single one of them, this year, all six of us can tell you proudly, customer service was number one. They all didn't say, no, we can't. It was, how can we make it happen? And they pitched in and made it to where we had the smoothest, best possible set circumstances for graduations this year. And so on behalf of all six of us, we want to say how proud we are. Thank you. As a district, we want all of our community to know all those behind the scenes people did phenomenal job. And I'm going to give you a written copy so you can share it in the next staff meeting with your staff. And Derek, I want to turn that into a Beacon Light story. So if you could email me, that would be great. So as you can see, we have some amazing things going on in the world of technology. And uh, so as I was going to say when I started, I was going to say technology is a game changer with the SUSD schools. And then I was going to say, no pun intended, but yeah, it is. So our students recently participated in botball competitions and in eSport tournaments. And these aren't your old fashioned games of checkers. They require computer skills way beyond mine. So on May 13th, DSUSD hosted the Los Angeles Regional Botball Tournament. 16 teams from across Southern California participated and DSUSD was well represented by teams from John Glenn, La Quinta and Palm Desert Middle Schools as well as La Quinta and Shadow Hills High Schools. And after only two months of practice, LQHS took first place overall in the competition. Um, Frank, do you wanna come up front and have your students be recognized? <laughs> so this is Frank Siha who teaches all of these amazing skills to our students as well as coaches um, the, uh, the team. <laughs> and we also had our elementary schools participating. So these were junior botball teams and their mission was to code their robots to complete the challenges and earn a button for each successful mission. So I think we have students here from some of the schools and those are Ford, Johnson and Reagan. And I know for sure Reagan's here. Um, other schools, come on up. <laughs> are we missing anybody? It's just Reagan who was able to come? Okay.
So on um, May 20th, we also had an eSports competition, and that was held, <coughs> excuse me, at the District Education Center at North Building. And 39 students from six schools participated. And the competing schools included Amistad, La Quinta, and Shadow Hills High Schools, as well as Desert Ridge, Indio, and La Quinta Middle Schools. So congratulations to all the competitors, and a huge shout out to these two gentlemen, Fernando Air Fighter <laughs> Alvarenga from La Quinta High School, who was named the DSUSD Esports Champion for 2023, and the middle school champion, Kevin Davila, is from Indio Middle School. And the two competitors went head to head, I'm told, on a Mario Smash Brothers match with Air Fighter achieving victory. So special thanks. I don't know if either of these gentlemen are here. No? OK. But special thanks to all those who attended and cheered them on. And I'd especially, as a matter of fact, they went four hours head to head, right, Tiffany? So I'd also like to give a real shout out to the other two people in that photo, Tiffany Norton, our Chief Innovation and Information Officer, and Kevin Bebo, Director of College and Career Readiness, for spearheading the introduction of eSports to our campuses. Do you both want to at least stand? <laughs> the final recognition for me this evening is a very special one. So on May 16th at 7.45 a.m., students and parents were walking in the crosswalk to Jackson Elementary School. A vehicle failed to stop and was inches away from the crosswalk. But Agent Jose Ortega called for the driver to stop, but he kept on going. In order to stop the vehicle, Agent Ortega literally jumped on the hood of the car Stunned by the action, the driver stopped. So Agent Ortega actually jumped in front and on top of a moving vehicle in order to save lives. <clears throat> Agent Ortega, despite some severe bruising, turned around and resumed his job. And he only went to seek medical attention after all the students were safe in school. Principal Jose Montano, I don't see him in the audience, but he asked me to read this statement. Since Jose joined the Jackson family, he has been extraordinary. He always goes above and beyond what is expected of him. And he goes about his work with students at the center of his work and actions. He said, I never have to ask Jose to do anything because when I think of it, he's already done it. We're very fortunate and honored to have Jose as part of our family, and we hope that he will continue to support and protect this community. Not all heroes wear capes, some wear security vests, and are disguised as DSUSD security agents at Jackson Elementary. Please join me in a standing ovation for Jose Ortega. <laughs> My part of the evening's recognition is over, but I'm going to bring up another Desert Sands um, staff member. So please join me in uh, welcoming Patricia Doherty, or Trisha as we call her, the Migrant Education Project Facilitator to the podium. Trisha. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. So um, I'm here, I've been with, uh, lucky enough to oversee the migrant program for Desert Sands for the past seven years. So it's really been a privilege. And we're here to talk about the inaugural Migrant Leadership Club at, that started at um, Indio High School. It was started by um, Carlos Gomez and Yolanda Delora, both counselors at Indio High School. And the, the focus of the Migrant Leadership Club was to build um, professional capacity for the students, um, help them realize, um, uh, sorry, so, um, build self-esteem and um, 
the, also the group focused on career and college uh, readiness and getting um, the students focusing on field trips or they went on field trips to focus on that. Um, there were 10 students in the inaugural group, uh, four of them which were our seniors and we're here to recognize them. Uh, a lot of them had to work tonight, so mm -hmm. not all of them are here, but I'm going to introduce them anyhow. And uh, because they really did a fantastic job. First, um, he is not here tonight, but Ramon Aguilar, and he is going to Cal Poly Pomona. He's gonna study atmospheric science, and he wants to be a meteorologist. So, yeah. Um, I don't see her here, but maybe she snuck in. Um, Belinda Castaneda, some of you might have seen her article in the Desert Sun. She is going to Stanford on a full scholarship. She here? Yeah. Oh. Well. Yes. And Belinda is going to study math, so she'll be a math major. So we're very happy for Belinda. Um, we also have Montserrat Quadros Guzman here with her mom, Liliana. And she is going to go to Cal State San Bernardino, and she's going to be studying entrepreneurship. So Montserrat, would you like to come up? Bravo, Montserrat. And also, she's also working tonight. So Perla Cepeda Seja uh, is going to be attending University of California, Irvine, and she'll be studying engineering. So yeah, some really some pretty smart cookies. And I don't, also, the, I wanted to mention the medallion they're wearing um, was designed by them and, and the counselors together. So it really represents a lot of the migrant program. So thank you so much, girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are there any comments, Mr. Duran? Oh, wow, so many. I think I'll go in reverse order here. Belinda, Montserrat, I mean, I'm so proud of you. I know I speak for everybody up here. What an incredible accomplishment to go on to college. Good luck to you. Um, I'll share, I'm also an entrepreneur major, so uh, that's kind of nice, but you can always do whatever you want, and that's the beauty of entrepreneurism. And with math, I can tell you that, uh, <laughs> that that's so needed in today's world. I mean, just to have somebody out there at Stanford learning math, that would, I mean, or studying math is incredible. Uh, so Patricia Doherty, congratulations to you, and, and my kudos to you and your fine staff on all that you've done, and the incredible, um, icon or uh, that you have designed. I thought that was really amazing. Um, Shadow Hills, I guess I wore the right shirt today, right? <laughs> Might have been the only one clean, but don't tell anybody. But I want to thank everybody for coming out today. Um, I can't begin. Kudos to the baseball team. I know how difficult it is to coach, to take over a program, to be so successful like that. I mean, what an incredible group of kids. I know a couple of them. I share one student with him, um, or one athlete, should I say. So. Um, I just want to say congratulations to you. And without the, the support of Coach Walsh, I don't think any of that's uh, even possible. Marjorie Lopez, I know, uh, incredible, outstanding, um, you know, athlete. The, the, the Tamble family, his son, the coach. The, what, I mean, just what more can you say? They're just stellar all the way around. Kaylin Montano, Jocelyn Sandoval, Isabel Navarro. Navarro I just want to congratulate you, too. Um, who else did I have here? It's it's a it's a labor of love when you're in coaching. I can tell you that um, these coaches go through incredible training, and the hours they have to put qualifying themselves to work with these athletes is um, is is immense and very difficult. Um, Frank Seha, what a great job. Where are you at, Frank? Okay, great job. What a what a big hand to you. Um, I don't know. I'm sure you work Shirley uh, with uh, Sherry Gunlock, and and Sherry's an incredible. She coaches also too at Shadow Hills. Incredible coach. What you guys do in bot, uh, I think that's just amazing. Uh, those students and and the bot wars and whatever that they design and do, it's 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 
it just brings all the skills that you learn every day from math, physics, science, et cetera, to, to bring it live and let them um, enjoy themselves. Oh, where did I go? Derek Lawson, I know you spoke today and kudos and thank you for all that you do too. I know there's a lot of people behind the scenes that do that stuff when, it, when a graduation goes off. Uh, and I just wanna say thank you to them having attended many graduations in my career. I know it's not, they're never seamless. There's always something at the last minute, but our staff always seems to pull through and make them look flawless and beautiful. So thank you. Uh, Agent Jose Ortega, I can't tell you. That's, I'll get choked up. Thank you. And, oh, to Fernando, the air fighter. I mean, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can play a video game, but the only thing I would do is, is break it. I mean, it wouldn't even work after I was done with it. I think I pretty much, I hope I've gotten everybody. Let me see that I think I saw speak there or come about. I tried to take some notes, but uh, I want to just say thank you, everybody who comes here, who's watching online. Uh, we really appreciate your your commitment to the education here for our students in Desert Sands Unified School District. And remember that we're always here to serve and to see the success of our students as they not only go K through 12, but as they move on through life. So remember that the teachers that, you, that you've met along the way know that they'll always be there for you. Thank you. I just wanna say that we are at board um, comments at this, at this time. So do you have anything additional that you need to say or are you good? No, I'm, I was just happy to attend a couple graduations and I thought they ran seamlessly. I think Derek covered that for me. So uh, thank you so much. Um, I think Mr. Duran said most of it. Uh, I, I agree, congratulations to all of our staff and our students. Um, most people know that safety and security is at the top of my list for um, all of our students and our staff. So to Agent Ortega, I wanna thank you for what you did. Um, I know that the parents appreciate it more than you can imagine. Um, so for my last few weeks, um, I did a few things. I went to Sunnyland's visit with the superintendent, some of our cabinet and some of our board members. Um, I attended three of the graduations, La Quinta, Palm Desert and Shadow. Um, I invited uh, President Porras to Carter Elementary for the last day of school. We spent some time together there for a good visit. I attended the Franklin IB um, exhibition for their fifth graders. Um, and then last, I attended with everybody, the Sands of Time. And for me, um, something that was really um, full circle was being at the retirement of the student teacher from my first grade class at Gerald Ford. So I was really grateful to be a part of that. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Yes, I just wanna say congratulations to all the athletes that, that did come here to, for us to showcase you at Shadow Hills and the other schools. And thank you to Agent Ortega as well. Um, I attended the Earhart uh, fifth grade IB exhibition, which is always a great thing to see how they're planning to reach out globally and make a difference in the world with something that they're passionate about. The Sands of Time to see all the, the people that are uh, reaching their milestones of 20 years with the district, 25, 30, and even 40 years is amazing, as well as the retirees that are luckily riding off into the sunset. I did was able to go to our the McCallum's invitation again to Desert Sand students and parents to uh, attend the Pacifico Dance Company. It was amazing uh, dance if, uh, company if you ever get to see it. And I attended uh, six of the graduations. So I had to miss Shadow Hills, the windiest one, to see my own nephew graduate in, in uh, Ontario. And the Sunnylands tour was uh, really amazing. Um, we got to go in the home as well. There are different tours there. And hopefully these historical, this historical place could be uh, brought in and shared with our seniors, or not seniors, our high school students in some way uh, as they study that time of time of our country when a lot of these things were happening um, with the pe famous people that attended at that home of the Annenbergs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez. I'll start off by 
thanking Mr. Ortega for your commitment to our students and putting yourself at risk. That's uh, commendable. So thank you, sir, for all your, your work day in and day out. And, um, you know, in light of you saw the news right before coming here, how in, uh, I think it was Virginia, today there's a graduation, there's some shootings, so our prayers are with those families today. Uh, so it really ref uh, brings to the forefront uh, the thoughts when uh, Mr. Lawson was sharing. Um, just thank you to everyone who puts these things together because there's so many things that go on behind the scenes to make it happen everywhere from maintenance and grounds to nutritional, fiscal, graphics, tech, security. Uh, it does take the whole team to do it. So we want to definitely acknowledge uh, everyone and say thank you for putting on fabulous, uh, memorable graduations. And so thank you to, uh, to everyone there. Uh, Marjorie Lopez, thank you for the amazing work that you're doing and wish you success in all your endeavors. Uh, it's clear that you're very talented, so uh, keep pushing forward and you know your grit is definitely on display, so uh, keep it up. Um, Caitlin Montano and the three other young ladies who are going on to wrestling uh, in uh, Fargo, that's an ama amazing accomplishment. And also the baseball team at Shadow, you guys are, are doing some awesome things. Uh, things and you're bringing a great spotlight to not only yourselves, your school, but the district as a whole. So thank you for that. And Mr. Seha, great stuff that you're doing. But I, I, you know, I've known you for a long time. You've done always amazing work. So I want to thank you for the dedication that you're uh, demonstrating and the commitment you get to doing and success you're having. Wish you the best and uh, let us know if we can be of support to anything that you're doing, sir. Great work. And behind a great man is always a great woman. So thank you, Lorelai. So <laughs> good job. Uh, Esports, so nice that we have esports. And as we're building that up across the valley, um, congratulations to Fernando and Kevin for their accomplishments with esports. Uh, it's something that we definitely want to build up. So uh, I'm looking forward to having some friendly competitions across the valley. Um, and our migrant uh, leadership. So Belinda and Montserrat, you guys are. Uh, Certainly amazing young ladies. We want to acknowledge your efforts and accomplishments. We wish you the best. And, you know, they have a, a vast program. So if you ever need any additional supports, that I know that we have people here that can help help you with that along with our COE. Uh, but you guys are doing amazing things. We want to just acknowledge you guys for what you're doing. Uh, besides the graduations, we attended also had atten an opportunity to attend uh, a graduation of sorts at Jefferson Middle School. Um, they had a graduation for a group of students who need extra support. They call it Joven Noble. And what they're doing is getting a group of students who need additional supports, and they're providing that. And when the AP comes up to you and says, this program is doing amazing things for our students who need the most work, it really puts a spotlight on, uh, on where our services need to be focused on. And uh, to any other middle schools that uh, may have similar needs, you know, I encourage you to reach out to Jefferson Middle School to find out what they're doing with their COVID Noble program. And I think that's it. So thank you guys. Thank you. Um, Agent Ortega, thank you so much. I, like Michael, when I was hearing that, I got choked up just thinking about you putting your life on the line for our students. So really appreciate that. And I'm so thankful that you did not get hurt. So thank you so much. Um, Shadow Hills and uh, La Quinta and all the athletes, congratulations and keep up the great work. I'm so excited um, that you guys are moving forward uh, with that. And uh, Tiffany and Kevin for spearheading the um, eSports. I think that's so cool. You know, 10 years ago that didn't even exist, right? So I think it's pretty neat that uh, our kids are able to, to do that. and. Four hours, my God. But you know what? My son spends hours online playing games with his friends. And it's just like, you know, a long time ago, people were like, oh, don't spend so much time on the computer. But here we are. So anyway, um, and excited about the Rajas having the migrant leadership um, program. That is so cool. I'm a Raja, in case you guys don't know that. There's three of us up here. Um, but anyway, I, I thought that was really neat. I love the little um, emblem, too. That is just super unique, and I love that. So anyway, congratulations, and I wish you all the best going forward with your um, schooling and careers. And what else was I going to say? Oh, 
Um, Derek like totally stole my thunder with the compliments about the high school graduations. So I went to every graduation. There were seven, so, and um, they were all amazing. And that's what I wanted to give. Derek basically said everything. All the, all the people in the background that you don't see did an amazing job. Our security guards are just fantastic. We were, we were complaining and saying, oh, we're so tired, you know, all these graduations we're going to. And we're like, yeah, security's really tired because they're out there busting their butts, you know, for us. And, um, but they got us to where we needed to be, made sure all the campuses were safe. Um, fantastic job. Thank you so much, Ryan, with your team. You did an awesome job. Um, and Nutrition Services, of course, always has excellent food, you know, at every location. And um, what else was I gonna say? Oh, technology. You guys did an amazing job with um, providing the uh, technology for all families that could not be at graduation, but could actually watch live. And so that was wonderful. Everything went just so smooth. We were just like amazed at how smooth it was. Shadow Hills had the windiest graduation. The kids were having to hold, I was having to hold their little hats on so that they wouldn't blow off during pictures, but it was great. Every kid, the energy at the high school graduations was wonderful. It was wonderful to see them excited. And so from that end, graduation to, I went with um, Dr. Watson to Carter Elementary. So it's so neat to see the little TKs, you know, starting off school and they're super excited for the last day of school, of course, right? Cupcakes and all kinds of fun stuff. But um, I was invited by Carter Cougar to go and give a delivery of a birthday delivery balloons to this little girl, it was so adorable. And if any of you do not know, our very own Dr. Watson is the cougar. So she, she's amazing. Anyway, she said I could tell. She said I could tell. I got permission. I got permission to tell. So anyway, nobody at Carter knows. But it's so cute. All the, all the little kids just had to hug the cougar. So anyway, it was super cute. And um, anyway... Um, I think that that is it, but thank you all so much. It was a, it was a wonderful way to end our year. So Dr. De Mulver. Yes. Okay. We can trust you all to keep that secret. Right? <laughs> okay. You have to sign a paper on your way out saying you're not going to tell anybody. Um, no, I wanted to just, um, to Agent Ortega, thank you. There really are not words to express, um, the gratitude for what you did for our students. And I think it speaks volumes to who you are as an individual um, and also a reflection of our security team as a whole. Um, but please know that you have our ever ending gratitude for what you did, so thank you. Um, I also just wanna say congratulations to everyone else that was highlighted tonight. I think the board did such a great job um, on highlighting them, but especially want to um, say how amazing it was to have the two students here with us this evening um, from the Migrant Ed club and what an amazing job that you did on your medallions. I first want to apologize uh, that you were not able to wear those at graduation for the mix up, but I will selfishly say that I'm glad that you're here so that we got to see you because um, we're so proud of you and even for those that weren't here, but I do apologize for that and I'm so grateful that you're here with us this evening and so excited to see what you do um, in the years to come. Uh, I also, one of the events that wasn't mentioned, I want to just give a shout out to um, President Andrew Parra from CSCA and his team did an amazing job on Friday highlighting our classified employees and having an end of the year celebration for them. And I got to stop by and it was wonderful. We're so grateful for all of our employees, uh, but it was very special to be able to highlight our classified employees. So great job, Andrew, appreciate you doing that. Uh, and then today is the first day of summer school. If you can believe it, we finished the graduations and now we start it again. So uh, I just wanna give a huge shout out to all the staff all across the district that's working summer school. Uh, we appreciate you so much. Uh, I know it was a very short um, weekend break in between <laughs> the end of the school year uh, and the start of summer school, but you're greatly appreciated. And I know it means the world to our students. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna give uh, the audience an opportunity to, to leave if you'd like to at this time. Go and get have ice cream and celebrate. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome to stay. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to leave. <laughs> Okay, so we are at public comments on open session items, communications from the floor in accordance with the bylaws of the board, number 9323-62519. Time is reserved for oral communications by members of the Board of Education or by citizens. Citizens wishing to be heard on agenda items, regular or special meetings, and or non-agenda items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board regular meetings only, shall have a three minute limit. A total of 20 minutes will be reserved for public comment on each item. The board president with the concurrence of the board may extend this time if deemed appropriate due to the number of citizens wish to speak on an item. In accordance with the law, the board cannot take action on any matter not appearing on the agenda as indicated by in, in by as indicated in bylaws of the board number 9232.262519 individual speakers shall be allowed 3 minutes to address the board on each agenda regular or special meeting or non-agenda item a regular meeting the board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes Please be advised that there is a possibility that some items discussed during public comment will not be developmentally appropriate for minors. We ask that parents use their discretion when choosing to remain in the boardroom during public comment. If you choose to leave the room, you may wait in the overflow location at the end of the hallway and you will be notified when public comments have concluded. Okay, so these are the online public comments. Name, Sonia Pisti. I want to publicly thank and acknowledge Assistant Principal Mr. Guillermo Bautista, Office Specialist Ms. Jenny Melendez, and Office Specialist and Ms. Anna Acosta for all their graduation planning and hard work. This is Mr. Bautista's third graduation at Palm Desert High School and each year he goes above and beyond to ensure our students have the best graduation. John Parker, good evening. On the DSUSD website under social emotional wellness, there is a resource called Gender Spectrum. A while back, the Trevor Project was found to be an online platform where adults were able to make contact with underage children. It seems like the gender spectrum could potentially have the same issue. As it relates to the board, I would recommend that you audit the site to make sure this is not a conduit for child predators. Maybe one trustee could oversee the audit, gender spectrum lounge, online community for teens, and adults could be a problem. It's important to inspect what you expect. I'm sure you will agree it's also important for parents to be aware of what their children are involved with. The district has hired an army of mental health professionals. Is there a mechanism in place to qualify, quantify what treatments are being suggested and what the outcomes of those treatments are? As with the COVID injections, the adverse reactions were alarming. That's putting it mildly. With the AR6142.1, and BP6142.1 in effect, hopefully we won't repeat the same mistake of implementing state mandates without evaluating the impact and making adjustments accordingly. Shelley Mast, a new study has found that California school system ranks at number 44 in the United States, just six spots from the bottom of the list. And yet we taxpayers fund $23,000 dollars per student for California public school education. 
On the elected board's agenda for tonight, under consent item 26, are contractor agreements, <coughs> excuse me, for counseling services, TLC counseling for our precious and vulnerable kids. However, TLC counseling does not exist as a business entity. How much are we paying them? Would you rather your children were prepared for life with basic reading, writing, accurate American history, math, and critical thinking skills, or be counseled as to what gender they feel like today? We need to stand up for our children and not let them be counseled by other than their parents who love and support them and are ultimately responsible for them. It's just common sense. Okay, Vanessa Aguilar. Hello. Um, ready? Yeah, just speak into the microphone, hon, please. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Vanessa Aguilar. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I currently work in the Desert Sands Medi-Cal program. I've had experience of working in the Medi-Cal program for six years prior to Desert Sands. Um, I was present at the last board meeting and I know there was some questions left that I thought might need to be clarified. The first one was, what is the difference between the school-based mental health therapist and Medi-Cal therapist? School-based mental, School-based mental health therapists also provide individual sessions, but their sessions may be time limited to six to eight weeks. Their priority is special education students. They spend time up to 40 hours, according to their service, uh, mental health service manager, to do one assessment. They attend IEP meetings, provide groups for special education students and general education students, leaving no time, little to no time, for individual sessions for general education. Their position is 11 months. Medi-Cal therapists are contracted to work 12 months during breaks as well. As a Medi-Cal therapist, I've provided individual, family, and group therapy. I utilize the MOU that we have with the psychiatrist. We have linkage to behavioral coaches in home and school supports. We service, our services have no time limitation. So if a student needs to be serviced from the beginning of the school year throughout the summer, there's no limit to how many sessions they can have. We also provide services to students with an IEP. In fact, 57% of our referrals are students who have IEPs. I currently service 10 sites. So I just want you to keep in mind that all of our time travel from each site to our office is reimbursed. In the last meeting, documentation was described as time consuming. Please note that all documentation is reimbursed. The documentation needed is objective measures required by the state to identify students' needs and progress. You asked about the foster youth. We receive referrals directly from social services. We work with the social workers, foster parents, and provide quarterly updates. These tools are specifically used to make sure the students do not fall through the cracks statewide. According to Riverside County, we operate as an extension of the county and as school based, with school-based employee access. In other words, we're the outside clinic within the district. Mr. Duran, I think you asked, who are we impacting by closing this program? Many of our students have single parent households. We're creating barriers to their treatment. Their parents work multiple jobs and make it almost impossible for them to take time off of work to go to a clinic that closes by 5 p.m. Please keep in mind, this may also impact their absence in school. For those that believe that the paperwork is not worth the financial reimbursement, I believe you might have lost sight of who we serve, our students, families, and taxpayers. Thank you, God bless. Thank you. Monica Patino Ayala. Oops. Are we ready? So my name's Monica um, Patino. I'm a marriage and family therapist. I was hired as well to work in the medical program. Um, I just want to share a couple barriers and answer also some questions that were addressed in the last board meeting that we were present. Um, since the beginning of the school year, um, we've had some difficulties getting our program up and off the ground. Um, we've had some introductory schedules for the counseling meetings 
We were removed from the agenda on multiple occasions. Um, we were unable to work our 12 month contract with it, which it states in the county contract, um, which means our children during Christmas break had two weeks with no services. And again, just to reaccount our services are high acuity. Um, beginning August 3rd, we've operated with two full-time therapists, one supervisor who helps with a small caseload billing supervision, and we had one peer partner. We had a community liaison that started on March, March 14th, 2023, and then on March 20th, we were notified the cabinet decided to end our Medi-Cal contract for the following year. And the last meeting, we were told fiscal was the reasoning behind the Medi-Cal county contract, which is difficult to understand based on a program uh, made for billing reimbursements. Um, so just to clarify some numbers, we're reimbursed $2.85 every, every client contact minute and $2.20 for every case management, SST, IEP, staff consultation, phone calls, and we also get reimbursed for our travel time from school to school. Um, uh, for anybody who's not clinical, one intake assessment will be billed approximately 150 minutes, equaling $427. A 50 minute session could equal out to $142. So if you have a therapist seeing six clients a day, we're weekly bringing in 4,200, monthly 16,800, and annually could be up to 200,000. This is not including breaks and um, holidays. So we do have to account for that. So despite the challenges that we face, this year we've collected $100,000. Uh, we had to increase our budget, which is actually on the board meeting agenda tonight to 350,000. Um, we have invoices pending 60,000 that we have not collected through April, not including May services. We've provided 1,233 services to our students with 2.5 staff members working with students. Um, so in a fully operating system, we have potential in Desert Sands to be a clinic similar to Latino commissions or Jewish family services, and it would all be internal, bringing back reimbursements to the district. Um, we could also hire interns at a smaller, um, based on their experience, they would have a smaller salary, which we would be able to cover. Desert Sands is 60 to 70% have Medi-Cal eligibility, so we have a lot of students. Um, as a licensed therapist in the largest district in the Valley, in the middle of a mental health crisis, I'm really struggling to understand why, we'd in, why we would not invest in a fully operating mental health clinic. We've worked with our school-based therapists, they're amazing, and we've still been able to help more than 70 students at one time. Um, we're negatively impacting the mental health of our students and their families by creating barriers to access by removing these services. Um, I hope you all take the information just into consideration and see what on a large scale this is gonna have on impact to our district. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Lee. Okay. Okay, Brittany Estrada and Salvador Estrada Jr. Okay, I don't know if they're outside or can we check and see if they're outside maybe? It was Brittany and Salvador Estrada. Thank you. Okay. So that concludes our um, public comments. Thank you. Okay, information. Indio High School cheerleading team participation in the USA 2023 cheer camp in San Diego, California during July 21st through the 24th, 2023. Indio High School cross country team participation in the Mammoth Running Camp in Mammoth Lakes, California during August 3rd through the 8th, 2023, and the Head Start Program Report for April, 2023. Staff conference items, Dr. Mae Walmer. Uh, yes, thank you. We have two this evening, and uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Wood to begin. All right, well, good evening, everyone. So tonight we'll be presenting the Local Control and Accountability Plan for 2023-2024. Uh, excited to uh, have our presenter tonight, our former LCAP coordinator, Kristen Wood. Good evening, I'm back. 
just for the thing that you always want to hear every year at this time, the LCAP. I also want to do a quick shout out to two of the La Quinta Middle staff here uh, representing eSports and Botball. So there are two coaches that participate in that, so they were here for that. And then they said they would stay because they're my fans tonight. So Hi. that's kind of exciting. Yay. Two more fans for the LCAP lady. <laughs> All right, let's go. Good evening. Tonight we're going to present the annual review of the 2324 Local Control and Accountability Plan. Your LCAP packet for this evening contains a copy of this presentation, an infographic that summarizes the LCAP, and a draft of the LCAP that has colorful flags separating it into different sections. The LCAP also contains the budget overview for parents, which is that first pink flag labeled BOP, and Mr. Aquino will address that at the end of the presentation. The state of California has identified eight priorities for improving student outcomes that must be addressed in the LCAP. Moving clockwise around the diagram and beginning with the three components found with the conditions of learning, that red section, let's start with basic services. Basic services is the priority that provides all students access to fully credentialed teachers, instructional materials that are aligned with state standards, and facilities that are maintained and are in good repair. The next is implementation of state standards. This relates to implementing California's academic standards, which includes California state standards in English language arts and math, the next generation science standards, and standards for English language development, social science, visual performing arts, and health education. The third priority is course access, which refers to student enrollment in a broad course of study, which includes all of the subject areas and courses required for graduation, plus college and career preparedness. The yellow section of the diagram is pupil outcomes, which includes pupil achievement and other pupil outcomes. Pupil achievement is improving student achievement and outcomes using multiple measures, including test scores, English proficiency levels, and graduation rates. Other pupil outcomes include the measurement of student outcomes related to other required areas of study, such as physical education and the state seal of biliteracy. That last section, the blue section of the diagram, relates to engagement and includes parental involvement, pupil engagement, and school climate. Parental involvement is identified by district seeking parent input in decision making and promoting parent participation in the educational program of all students. Pupil engagement is measured by school attendance rates, chronic absenteeism rates, dropout rates, and high school graduation rates. And the last one, school climate, is measured by student suspension and expulsion rates, and other local identified metrics, such as surveys of pupils, parents, and teachers on the sense of school safety and connectedness. The LCAP goals support DSUSD's mission and vision of inspiring and nurturing every student one opportunity at a time and being the district of choice to successfully prepare every student for college, career, and life. Goal one addresses students demonstrating growth as measured by federal, state, and district assessments. Goal two focuses on college and career opportunities. Goal three addresses safe, secure, and positive learning environments, and goal four supports the educational journey of the students with disabilities and their transition to college, career, and life. So let's look at how the LCAP goals align with the eight state priorities. Here you see goal one and connection to five of the priorities, basic services, implementation of state standards, course access, pupil achievement, and other pupil outcomes. Goal one begins on page 30. So now you're in your actual large LCAP document. And there's, it's marked by a small green flag labeled G1 and is supported by nine action areas, which has a small green flag labeled A1, which starts on page 34. It contains several actions and services under each area. Tonight, however, we'll highlight just a couple of them. So for highly qualified staff, that includes recruiting, selecting, and maintaining highly qualified teachers and supporting our school administrators and leadership development. The next one, professional development, includes providing instructional support and core content, inclusion for our students in special education, universal design for learning, and strategies that address the whole child. 
Instructional materials and assessment includes supporting the cost of consumable student materials, supports for next generation science standards and social study standards, supports for math intervention, and utilizing universal screening tools to monitor the mastery of state standards. Number four, technology, includes providing students with Chromebooks and tablets and supporting instructional technology and ensuring a safe and secure digital environment. Interventions include academic intervention programs aligned with MTSS and summer school programs. School site staffing includes maintaining student to teacher ratios, reducing class sizes in special education settings, and supporting classified salaries to support student learning. Parent engagement includes supporting our joint parent committees such as DAC and DLAC and supporting the English parent program, PK. Number eight, site-based student achievement support are actions and services that support school sites with their school plans to ensure student success and early childhood education programs maintains the opportunities for low-income families and English learners to attend highly qualified preschool programs and provide supports to enhance TK readiness for the transition into kindergarten. Next, we have goal two connections with three priorities highlighted, course access, pupil achievement, and pupil engagement. There are four action areas associated with goal two, which begins on page 51, and that small yellow flag labeled G2, and some of the highlighted actions, the small yellow flag labeled A2, which begins on page 60, are course access and advanced programs, includes programs such as AP, IB, and GATE, Number two, opportunities outside the traditional program include programs such as dual language immersion and virtual learning. Number three, career technical education includes not only supporting CTE programs at each of the high schools, but also implementing and supporting career-based learning activities for each grade span and supporting Project Lead the Way and military science. Number four, college going culture and broad course of study includes supports for AVID, college and career exploration, and completing the A through G sequence of courses for college preparedness. Now for goal three connections, there are uh, five of them highlighted here, basic services, course access, parent involvement, pupil engagement, and school climate. Goal three has nine action areas and begins on page 68, the small orange flag labeled G3, and some of the highlighted actions, the small orange flag labeled A3 on page 71. Number one, improve school attendance, is supporting schools with the analysis of attendance data, chronic absenteeism, intervention systems and supports, collaborating with community and government agencies to improve services and support to address student absenteeism. Site-based positive behavior supports programs includes the support and continued implementation of our district-wide and site-based MTSS programs. Counseling support and behavior health supports our student assistance program, school counselor ratios, professional development to support the work of MTSS, trauma-informed practices, and building community agency and partnerships. Number four, health and wellness for students includes supports for sports programs, including transportation, and providing vocational nurses to support health prevention and intervention programs. Positive and safe environment includes maintaining school site monitors, security, school resource staffing to ensure a sense of safety, maintaining transportation routes, and supporting safety committees as they revise and review their comprehensive school safety plans. Number six, clean and efficient environment provides custodial and maintenance services to support inviting schools and district environments. Communication provides the support for ongoing communication through newsletters, websites, parent view, and school messenger. Number eight, parent engagement provides supports for families uh, with attendance concerns and assist with other resources for mental health, basic needs, and community liaison assistance. Number nine, supporting the needs of the unduplicated student population includes professional development for teachers and staff, providing direct supports for students and families to ensure a full and equal opportunity to succeed in school. Targeted EL intervention for all elementary schools to ensure highly effective programming and support students 
and additional staffing at the secondary level to support ELD-related services. There are three state priority connections for goal four, course access, other pupil outcomes, and parental involvement. Goal four begins on page 87, flagged with a small blue flag uh, labeled G4, and has four action areas. And some of the highlighted actions with the blue flag labeled A4 begins on page 92. They are professional development that provides instructional support in core content inclusion, universal design for learning strategies, and strategies that address chronic absenteeism and college and career readiness. Number two, strategic alignment, includes ensuring equitable access for students with disability and utilizing the inclusive roadmap to access current strengths and weaknesses within regards to exclusive practices. Interventions in alignment with MTS sets, such as the Don Johnson UDL Toolkit, and support students with disabilities accessing grade level standards and course materials and assignments and utilizing project facilitators to support the implementation of specialty intervention and training programs. And last engagement, such as providing parent trainings that will highlight post-secondary opportunities and career paths for students with disabilities and monitoring student and family participation in student support services at their community events. Now that we got those goals and actions out of the way, we've covered uh, all of them um, in the, the slides four through 11, but now we're gonna take a look at from top to bottom what the actual uh, components of that LCAP is. It first begins with that budget overview for parents, back to that first pink slide labeled BOP, and then it goes to general information about our Desert Sands community, reflections on identified successes and areas for improvement, highlights of the plan, uh, comprehensive support and improvement, engaging educational partners, goals and actions, again, which was that slide four, increased and improved services, expenditure actions and carryover tables, and the LCAP ins instructions, which is a detailed instruction on how to address the components of the plan. As seen here, there are many educational partner groups that contribute to the process of reflecting on establishing priorities that are captured in the LCAP, such as community committees, parent committees, school site and district leaders, and students. Details regarding this process can be found in the section Engaging Educational Partners, which is the second small pink flag labeled EEP, which is on pages 22 to 29. It includes summaries of the process and as aspects of the LCAP that were influenced by specific feedback, such as continuing to provide evidence-based professional development, continuing to support all students graduating and being prepared to make a successful transition to further education and or career opportunities, the importance of providing academic interventions and social and emotional supports for well-being, supporting college and career readiness through AVID, recognizing the work done through the MTSS process and the importance of building family engagement. Desert Sands utilizes a four-stage problem-solving approach for ensuring continuous improvement with meeting our LCAP goals by planning, implementing, observing or studying those results, and then acting upon the lessons learned, we can provide best actions and services to support student success. The study portion of the Plan, Do, Study Act allows us to determine if we should formally adopt a metric action or service, adapt it, or abandon it when it's not proving to be successful. Educational partner groups participated in collaborative activities such as AVID World Cafes and structured collaborative groups where they analyzed and discussed metrics, actions, and services within each of the goals. Feedback was captured through collaborative discussions and activities with those meetings, but formally captured through thought exchange. There are three components when participating in a thought exchange. One, share, share your thoughts. Two, star, consider and rate the thoughts shared by other. And then three, discover, discover the ideas we all have in common and what we value as a community. And we love that it works on all devices. The thought exchange feedback is then analyzed for key ideas, 
key themes and concerns that influence the analysis and development of the LCAP. So what's new this year? In supporting our achieving goals, we have developed actions and services that reflect input from our educational partners. This includes hiring additional assistant principals or project teachers for elementary and middle schools, which will help provide positive climate and culture on each campus by supporting expanded learning programs, attendance, and other areas focused in connection with MTSS. Providing additional counseling position to middle schools to support social and emotional needs. Providing attendance and health office support at elementary sites with moving from half-time positions to full-time positions. Reinstating community technician positions to support attendance efforts and adding a second project facilitator position to support district-wide AVID, CTE, and GATE. A process that we'll implement moving forward is removing the bundling of actions and services and identifying them as standalones. As you see here in goal three, there is an action area such as health and wellness that contains three lines of actions. Moving forward, each action will stand alone with the projected budget line and the contributing factor next to it. In an effort to provide clarity to all educational partners, you have that additional infographic packet, I think it's about 12 pages, which is a cliff note or infographic version of the LCAP. This is an abbreviated version of the LCAP that captures critical information found in the document and summarizes all things LCAP, including plans to decrease achievement gaps, chronic absenteeism, and suspension rates, but then also increasing student ac achievement in all student groups, English learner academic success, MTSS, AVID at all school sites, and supports for mental health and social emotion, emotional well-being for staff, students, and family. It also provides a summary of the LCAP funding, in which I will now introduce Mr. Jordan Aquino, our Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, to address the funding overview, projected revenue, and budgeted expenditures. Okay, just one, one second. Are there any questions before Jordan? With that from anybody? What, with what Kirsten just presented, is there any questions before Jordan goes forward? Okay. Thank you, Kirsten. You're welcome. You gotta put that back in there. Yeah, so this just encapsulates the LCAP. Basically what you're seeing here is the pictorial representation of the budget. Um, they decided to use nice pie charts because mine are boring numbers <laughs> that I just throw out there with charts. Um, but at the end of the day, our total revenue budget is uh, it's about $494 million in the general fund. So basically half a billion dollars. So this just is a representation of the total amount of local control funding form, uh, funds, uh, which is about 82 million and overall all other identified actions in the LCAP of $264 million. But overall, the total revenue budget for our general fund is about half a billion. Um, and then this last uh, representation here shows that our expenditures in our budget that you're gonna be um, seeing this evening in totality is $470 million. And of all the actions and goals that um, Mrs. Wood was discussing during her presentation represent $210 million worth of expenditures. That's that. So now we can. So you saw a lot of color. Mine's not gonna have a lot of color. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, just the first slide, it's purple. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the state economy. So I'll read that first uh, bullet. State May revision highlights the volatile nature of California state revenues. We in California have a very progressive tax system and 65 of percent of all the taxes that we receive are based on personal income tax. And only 1% of Californians make up 50% of all of those taxes, which is a significant portion. It makes us highly volatile because our highest earners in California rely heavily on the asset market 
capital gains. And that's why when you see changes in the S&P, things that ultimately affect the asset, um, asset market, you're gonna see a lot of fluctuations in our, in our state budget. The May revision is projecting uh, a $31.5 billion deficit. Now in January, he was uh, estimating it to be 22.5 billion. That has increased by about $9 billion. Uh, the Legislative Analyst Office, which is a, another entity that works with, uh, in conjunction with the governor's office on developing a, and proposing and adopting a budget, uh, they are anticipating that it's gonna even be an 11.5 billion more uh, than the state's estimates. Uh, unemployment is low, spending is still hot as, as a result of strong sales tax revenues. The rest of, rest of the economy is making up for a loss in capital gains in a cycle. Um, with the deferral for taxes to October, the state is looking at, and or in the, their budget, they're anticipating 42 billion that they are gonna receive in that October uh, filing. So hopefully that that um, materializes um, and again, interest rates hikes uh, are high. The banking industry hasn't caught up with the rise in technology and the ability for account holders to pull back their funds. That's what caused the Silicon Valley Bank uh, scare. So there, this, we're in a very uncertain time, I would say. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump straight into the general fund. Here is a, a non-nice pie chart <laughs> uh, but really summarizes that large packet that you have of the general fund, both the unrestricted discretionary side and the restricted, more targeted program side, all in one slide. And you can see that we're about $500 billion in 22-23 that we are spending uh, in the general fund. Now, this is the strongest fund balance that we've ever had, at least in the 20 years that I've been doing school stuff. This is is about as strong as it has gotten. Now, 25% is in the unrestricted general fund and 18% is on the restricted side. Uh, and so totally, in total, it's 43% combined fund balance. Now on the unrestricted side, we'll talk a little bit on the, on, on the, sorry, on the restricted side, there's things like carryover from the ELOP program, the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant, the Learning Recovery Block Grant, which we just got a $12.6 million reduction to, and then redevelopment funds, which we targeted in our um, facility study session uh, for that. I promise you I'll go through some of the slides a lot faster, but I think it's important that we hone in on these. Now in 0506, the fund balance was 9%. So if you were here in 2005, 2006, the fund balance was 9%. In 0607, the fund balance was 10.91%. We are at 43%. Now what's, why did I talk about the 0506 and 0607 years? Is because the recession hit school districts subsequent to those years. And the statutory COLA in those years was 5.6 in the year preceding, and uh, um, subsequent year. And then the year after that, the statutory COLA was 4.25%. But the state had to deficit us because it couldn't afford things. And that first year after the recession, because we, we, we get impacted a little bit later than the rest of the economy does. We had a negative 2.67% COLA, and in the following year, we had a negative 7.64% COLA. And we anticipate those COLAs, because that helps us with our step and column, everything that gets more expensive. So if you look at the 2009, 2010 year, that was an 11.9 swing. So we didn't get the 4.25% COLA that we were anticipating, and not only did we not get that, the state deficited us from zero to negative 7.64%. So at that time, school districts dealt with a lot. And if you were a part of the district at that time, I'm sure you can um, tell everybody every, all the things that were implemented in order to balance the budget. Now, the next two slides was not on the slide presentation that was uploaded. I just added these slides about an hour and a half ago. And the reason I did that was because as I was reviewing the draft that was uploaded, uh, this is the final version, was I realized that it was really hard to parse even that summary slide that showed the general fund budget without parsing out the unrestricted and the restricted side. And the reason why I say that is because I always say the unrestricted side is the, the, the district's budget health, right? 
So if you, could, if you see the net change, that is, to me, that is the line that describes the district's fiscal health. It says, how are you doing on an ongoing basis? Do your revenues outpace your expenses? And you could see here that the net change is significantly positive. And a lot of that is predicated on the fact that we are projecting an 8.22% COLA this year. Now, if that materializes, that would be fantastic. That 8.22% COLA represents $18.2 million more that we will receive annually. So you can just, just even see, if that COLA just didn't exist, it's gonna wipe out that net change of 17.7, but uh, fortunately, um, we hopefully will be funded that. Now that also represents $1,309 more per student, or really for per attendance. Now on the restricted side, you could see, I made a mistake, that there's a net change on there. So those positive numbers are really negative numbers. I, I, I mistakenly put it that way. It should be negative 17.7 million. And that's because like anything with carryover, you're supposed to spend it. You have carryover in ELOP, we have the redevelopment monies that we're gonna be spending down on um, targeted projects, those types of things. Now this was a slide that was uploaded. Those first two weren't, or yeah, the first, the last two weren't. This is a combination of both. And you could see overall, it's this modest change. It doesn't look like a lot, but there's a story to be told behind those. So of, our, of that ending fund balance that had that 43% uh, combined amount, here is all the designations tied to that fund balance. Because this is a question that I will always get. And if anyone's who's analyzing the budget, it could be anybody, any entity, any, any individual will say, oh, it's a lot, Two, 250 million is a lot of money. And I'll say, yeah, it is. Um, now there are certain restrictions that we have like non-spendable, you know, no one's blinking at $350,000. Um, we have a reserve for uncertainty that's required based on a district of our size. We have to reserve 3% and that's 14.7 million. So I'm kind of jumping around now we have the restricted side of that also, that again, ELOP, the redevelopment money that we're using for projects, and then the other committed, committed DS 2022, and then the 10% cap committed DS 2023. What the heck is all that? We are required to not maintain more than 10% of our fund balance. That's the law based on where we're at with the state budget. The other committed, when we committed those back in the day, 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, those were all for one-time mandates. So we were getting all these claim reimbursements that we were reserving for things like textbooks, things that we would normally do when you're trying to be fiscally prudent with spending dollars. When they're come in as a one-time nature, you reserve them for one-time items. Um, then we, did a resolution last year to stay below the 10% threshold and did a commitment, and I put DS there, and that's really, a, that's a code. That DS is deficit spending. It gives, at the end of the day, it gives the district flexibility. We did identify at that time for all types of things, technology textbooks, universal pre-K, OPEB, just to book at it. But the truth behind that is, we've done so much with all the one-time funds that we've received through ESSER, the block grants, We've done a lot of that. And at the end of the day, this 10% reserve puts, a, puts almost a burden, um, I'm saying that, a burden, because if we need to spend it on all these other things that we need to identify, we would have to commit it and identify it for all those things. And I'm not gonna say why we can't identify it for certain things, um, because we can't, and there's rules behind it, and I won't get into all that. But at the end of the day, we have the most flexibility with the resolutions that, being our, that are being presented to the board, that if we need to be flexible with our spending, we can be flexible with it. Now I'm gonna go over the major expenditure categories, uh, or expenditure, the major revenue variables, and this shows you what the COLAs are historically the last couple of years, and what the COLAs are projected in this budget. We have an 8.22% COLA for 23-24. We're showing a negative enrollment uh, or enrollment decline of 395 students. Um, and 
431 students in the following year. The, in the, the previous couple years, we've declined approximately, I'm trying to find my place here, we, we declined 1.5% this year, 0.96% the year before, and 3.36% the year before that. We're roughly around a 2% declining uh, enrollment district. Now, for the 23-24 and 24-25 year, we're declining around 1.75 or 1.7% and 1.8% of our total enrollment. Our attendance is around 89-90%, and our unduplicated pupil count, which is the percentage that gives districts more money based on targeted needs, our neighboring districts are getting a lot more, and that's because their unduplicated pupil count and the needs there are higher. So they have a 90 plus, I believe even Palm Springs might be in the 95 plus range, but their funding will be impacted more significantly than ours because we're a district that has needs. There's another district that has bigger needs and then another district that has even bigger needs. And that's because of the student population. Now here's another um, representation of our LCFF revenues and the ongoing increase of about $18 million in 23-24. Now in 24-25 and 25-26, this is showing you the change in the amount of revenues that we're receiving. And you can see in 24-25 that our decline, of we're losing $4 million and then we're losing $2.1 more million based on our projections with the enrollment decline and the COLA. So what that tells you is normally in a normal year, COLA is supposed to give you more money. Our enrollment decline is so powerful that it's negating the COLA and it's actually giving us less money in the out year. And that's what this represents. So um, major expense assumptions that we always have to include in the budget, step in column. Step in column, which is a obligation for pay increases based on your placement on the salary schedule, that costs the district about $4 million a year. So if we're not manufacturing more students or the state doesn't give us any COLA, that $4 million has to get paid somehow. And that's what, um, you know, the uh, COLA helps negate that. We have CPI increases, meaning the cost inflation has significantly impacted our district. As an example, a carton of paper in April of 2021, that, so a box of paper, cost us $23 a box. And the three previous years prior to that, it, it went up by about 3%. The cost of a carton of paper in April of this, uh, this past April was $42.69. So that's an 83% increase over two years. So there is, you know, cost pressures on all aspects of our budget. So I'll go over briefly um, all funds, um, and this ending fund balance is the ending fund balance projection in the budget year. Charter schools um, with a $21.6 million uh, fund balance, adult education. You can see the fund uses there. I probably won't, won't read everything to you. We have our child development fund, um, our cafeteria fund, uh, which has been performing well over the last couple years and it has in previous years and that's uh, due to a variety of reasons um, that have been beneficial to the district. Uh, we have a $1.6 million reserve in Fund 17 for post-employment benefits. I really need to move that and put it towards our OPEB obligation, which is pretty significant, uh, but it's just it's sitting there. Um, our self-insurance fund, which is about $30 million, um, I'm trying to recall, there's about $700,000 for uh, dental uh, premiums. Um, I think there's about six or seven million for workers' comp, and then the balance is to fund our post-retirement uh, post benefits for employees. We have our facility funds um, that we've gone over in great conversation um, for Measure KK, our developer fees, our capital outlay and our CFDs, which we haven't issued any yet. Um, but you can see all the balances there and all the projects. If you're interested in uh, this is to the community, um, you could visit some of our facility needs uh, study session and maybe the notes on them on our website. 
So the economic horizon. Um, I added these last two charts here. So this is the federal funds rate. So one of the federal government primary responsibilities is to control inflation. And it's a tool that they use uh, to do that is moving around the federal funds rate, which impacts lending rates, mortgages, commercial loans. Now those gray charts are times of recession, economic recessions. And you could see that the bar is the federal government trying to combat inflation by raising the interest rate. And what followed that was an economic downturn. So you could see this history going back to 1970 and where we are at right now with the bar going up. The question is, is where are we gonna be at um, in the next couple years? And uh, often thought to be the biggest indicator of a recession is the inversion of the yield curve. Um, so it's where short-term treasuries. So similar to how we have bonds, the government also issues bonds. And when the short-term bonds rate is higher than the long-term ones, historically it, a recession has followed. And right now you can see that where those red arrows are, it's showing where the yield curve meaning that the short-term rates were higher. And once that happened, how soon thereafter did a recession follow? And you could see right now when that yield curve dipped below its And at some point, if history were to repeat itself, we potentially could be facing an economic recession in the future. So I will say an in inverted yield curve is unusual. It reflects bondholders' investors' expectation for a decline in longer-term interest rates, typically associated with recessions. Uh, one thing I will just add in uh, just kind of a note, in 2006-2007, the COLA was 5.92%. That was the highest COLA since 1990. Then it went to 4.53% the year after, so in seven, eight, it went to 4.53%. So not only was it the statutory COLA, the recorded COLA, but it was also funded at that same rate. The following year, like I mentioned before, the COLA then was negative 2.67, followed by a negative 7.64% in 910. The next time the statutory COLA peaked over 5.92% was 2022, 2023. So if we look at historically where we are at, there's a lot of indicators that's, that's pointing to the fact that potentially we could be dealing with some difficult times. I will say that the governor's budget does not include a recessionary scenario in it. And if it does, it'll exacerbate the state budget deficit by another $30 billion. Um, and that, or $40 billion, I'm sorry about $40 billion, and that scenario was run by the Department of Finance, who is the department that works directly for the governor's office. So again, I think this is probably the riskiest budget um, that I'm presenting to you. Um, I think we are in a very good position. Um, I think we've done really amazing things, the board and the district, with regard to capitalizing on, on the pandemic, really because we were very cognizant about how we were receiving those one-time dollars and how we were budgeting for all the positions that we were adding in the district, the mental health therapists, about making sure that we have a sustainability plan to maintain employment in this district. And that's it, any questions? Any questions, Mr. Duran? No, I think it was a very well presented um, budget report. Um, I do too believe in that inverted yield curve. I've seen that before uh, historically and I'm thinking like 2025 or so, hopefully for a soft landing, you know, as they say economically, but who could tell? I mean, when when the bow might, if it, if it does uh, have a downturn. I'm curious about pension obligations and, um, you know, I, I think maybe for the average um, listener out there today and stuff is that they don't realize that that we basically pay those out of our budget correct yes. and um you can actually look those up but uh it's a i was wondering though and, and not to put you on spot but if sure. uh, because it, it it's a it's a percentage obviously of our budget 
-hmm. Any idea off the top of your head, but if not, you need down the line. So I can say on the, so we pay taxes for every dollar of payroll. So imagine for, and I'm just gonna include all the taxes, which would include Medicare, Social Security, if you pay into Social Security, those types of things. For a certificated employee, the percentage, um, so we pay 24% or 24 cents on every dollar for a certificate employee. And for a classified employee, we pay 36 cents on every dollar. And that, what's included in that percentage is the rising cost of pensions. Okay, and that's, that's one of the things I wanna put out there because I think it's very important. And I think Jordan understands this and I'm very glad that, that you're running this for us because it's imperative that not only that we think about today, but that we think about those that have worked here yesterday and before, because we have an obligation to those pensions in addition to the rising costs that we're meeting daily. So with that, it, you know, I just like to say that, and the only way I ever remembered this is, uh, so if, if we get an employee and that employee comes to us, uh, even though they've been working 30 years for an ABC district, wherever they're at, and they come with all their years of service, we absorb their pension as if they retire from us. Is that correct? Right. So, you know, and so that's expensive. And and uh, and and I I just want everyone to know that I'm cognizant of it. I appreciate that. I'm respectful of it, and I want us to continue to protect it. So that's the most that's one of the most important things that I think is important. But thank you for your stewardship. Thank you for your leadership, and I appreciate the budget this this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Ms. Pierce. I tried to keep up, but it is it is um, it is a lot to take in, and all the changes and the history that you bring to it can really uh, show us that you know we we at least are in a good position for what's happening, and that you've looked ahead, and we've looked ahead and seen that this downturn could be coming and we're in a good place so far. But when I think about the state budget and all the uncertainty there, then then that's kind of overwhelming. But as far as our funds and the way we spent them on technology and all the different things that we did with the therapists and everything, I'm so glad that all that was done with those funds, like you say, during the pandemic kind of worked out. Um, I was wondering on the, um, this is just a side note, on the downturn on enrollment, um, you know the new homes that are built all along Adams, the Solterra, that La Quinta in the city of La Quinta, and then the big three-story ones off Jefferson are in our school district. Mm -hmm. um, are do they are, have you already done projections on uh, those? Look like family homes, uh, family apartments. Yeah. So those all those areas that you referenced, there's one on um, Jefferson and. Uh, the 111, um, there's one on Adams um, right near the, the dealership, and then a potential uh, very controversial uh, development that is on 50th Street and Washington. Now, all of those developments reside within the Truman Elementary boundaries, and um, but the Truman, we have pretty significant capacity in Truman. Uh, if we not look at all the special programs that could be in some of those classrooms, I believe the last I look, uh, looked was we could accommodate uh, over 400 plus students uh, out of those residential developments. Um, now, hopingly that that materializes to additional students, um, but, you know, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Ho I hope. Okay, I was just curious. Thank you for your report. It was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Mr. Alvarez. So, yeah, Jordan, thank you for that presentation. I think it, where I'm, you know, I'm trying to wrap my mind around is um, despite being in a good position, we need to be mindful of the challenges that may be coming and how that impacts decisions we'll have to make this school year. That's correct. And so at the end of the day, my goal is to monitor the budget for superintendent, for cabinet, or for um, the board, is ultimately just to give you all the information that you need to make those decisions. I, I will say that we've positioned ourselves well. 
um, in the event that something were to occur, uh, obviously we will have to make adjustments as necessary, but I feel like we've positioned ourselves uh, pretty well. So what comes to mind is just how do we mitigate the effects of what's potentially coming with current trends, but thank you for that presentation. Are we also taking uh, questions now on the LCAP? Uh, just as an example on 1.5, uh, 1.5, to, you know, it mentions intervention support, but doesn't say what support. So we allocate 4.5 mil, um, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't identify one, what is being funded, what supports are being funded uh, on 1.1-52 uh, as, as a question. And then also additionally, um, there's no itemization. It just has an amount on every section but we don't know how much is going to what item. Um, you know, I'm thinking of just transparency. Uh, I know it's not gonna be this way, but let's say we have uh, five million, for example, and it could be four and a half million go to line item one, and the rest are getting, you know, pennies. Uh, so again, you know, maybe we need to, uh, if these are the items we're gonna focus on, maybe allocate funds to the items so that uh, individuals know how much we're, we're actually allocating to the different uh, sections, but uh, that's something to, to ponder. You don't have to answer that now. So, we, so we are, um, and part of the presentation talked about that. Where, when we next year we'll be doing the new three-year rollout, and that is the plan to break all that up. I mean, this is we refer to this as bundling, so we will no longer be doing the progressive bundling. Um, that's funny, progressive bundling. <laughs> <laughs> Bundle yeah. your auto, yeah. um, and, and it's for that reason, right? Just for greater transparency, and even in in the development of the LCAP, it helps us when we're writing and telling the story to actually see um, the amounts. Um, now, in the just to kind of address the first question, in the narrative, we go into great details of what all the different interventions and the impact and metrics tied to it. Um, it's just in in these actions, they're just succinct and just kind of quickly capture. Um, the overall area. Thank you. Well, Kirsten, it was really great seeing you up here doing the LCAP again. And Jordan, I really do appreciate all that you do. You are amazing. We are so blessed to have you. And um, anyway, my one complaint, though, is I think that it needs to be more detailed. I think there's not enough details in here. I'm kidding. I'm joking. You guys do an amazing job. I will make but, more detail. But I, I think I think you need to work on your uh, on your little um, circle graphs there, Jordan. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. You, you're awesome. Okay, public hearing. Public hearing number 08, 2022 to 2023, local control and accountability plan. I will open public hearing at 8.43 p.m. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Well, I'm not gonna wait a whole minute, you guys. So we will close the public hearing at 8.44. Number two, public hearing number 09-2022 to 2023, high school advanced placement biology textbook adoption. I will open public hearing at 8.45 p.m. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing at 8.46 p.m. Number three, public hearing number 10, 2022, 2023, high school advanced placement literature textbook adoption. I will open the public hearing at 8.47 p.m. Should I? Okay. Uh, is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? We will close. So I'm going, going to change that. It was 8.44 that I opened it and I'm gonna close at 844. 
and a half. <laughs> 10 seconds. Okay. <laughs> okay, public hearing number 11, 2022 to 2023, High School International Baccalaureate Biology Textbook Adoption. I will open the public hearing at 8.45 p.m. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing at 8.45 p.m. Public hearing number 12, 2022-2023, High School International Baccalaureate English te Literature Textbook Adoption. I will open the public hearing at 8.45 p.m. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing at 8.45 p.m. Public hearing number 13, 2022-2023, High School International Baccalaureate French Textbook Adoption. I will open the public hearing at 8.46 p.m. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Hearing none, we will close the public hearing at 8.46 p.m. Number seven, public hearing number 14, 2022-2023 and 2023-2024 budget adoption. I will open the public hearing at 8.46 p.m. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing at 8.46 p.m. General Functions Business Services. There are eight items in General Functions Business Services. With the thir first three being resolutions, which require a roll call vote, is there a motion to take items four through eight as a group or individually? So moved, Alvarez, take them as a group. Is there a second? Second, Pierce. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. Okay, resolution number 3 5 2022. 2023 authorization to commit unspent supplemental and concentrational grant fund balances. Is there a motion to approve um, this resolution? Governor? Is there a second? Uh, second, Pierce. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, since this is a resolution, it will be a roll call vote. Mr. Duran? Aye. Dr. Watson? Aye. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Mr. Alvarez? Aye. And I vote aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. Resolution number 3 6, 2022 2023, authorization for the Education Protection Account Spending Plan. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? Uh, make a motion to approve, Pierce. I'll second it. <clears throat> Any discussion? Hearing none, since this is a resolution, there'll be a roll call vote. Mr. Duran? Aye. Dr. Watson? Aye. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Mr. Alvarez? Aye. And I vote aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. Resolution number 37, 2022, 2023, authorization to commit fund balances. Is there a motion to approve this resolution? I make a motion, Pierce. Okay. Is there a second? Second it. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, um, this is a resolution, so it's a roll call vote. Mr. Duran? Aye. Dr. Watson? Aye. Ms. Pierce? Aye. Mr. Alvarez? Aye. And I vote aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. Okay. And now we're on to number 18. I want to say on that part before you say, I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, Roosevelt and Jackson are getting the, that paint and going to be looking good, I guess, yeah. by the time school starts. Yeah, definitely. That's great. Yeah, it'll be Thank awesome. You. Yeah, looking forward to seeing that. Uh, 
seat number 18, general functions, educational services. There are 17 items in general functions, educational services. Is there a motion to take these as a group or individually? Alvarez, a motion to take them as a group, one through 17. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Pierce. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. Okay, general functions, personnel services. There are five items in general functions, personnel services. Is there a motion to take these as a group or individually? A motion to take them as a group. Is there a second? I second that. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. And number 20, general functions, student support services. There are none. 21, general functions, superintendent. There are two items in general functions, superintendent. As one is a contract, it must be taken individually. Is there a motion to approve item number 21.1? I make a motion, Pierce. I'll second that. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. And amendment to the employment agreement for the assistant superintendent personnel services. Is there a motion to approve item 21.2? Oh, sorry. Oh, I did. Other way around. Yeah. Oh, I'm just, I'm just reading this. So I just. Oh, 20. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve 21.2? So moved, Alvarez. Second, Pierce. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. Calls for the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries five zero. Okay, there are no, yeah, consent items, student matters, there are none. Consent items, business services, there are 10 consent items for business services. Is there a motion to take them as a group or individually? I make a motion to take them as a group. Pierce? Alvarez? Is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. Okay, 24, consent items, educational services. There are 12 consent items. Is there a motion to take these as a group or individually? Motion to take them as a group, Alvarez. Is there a second? Second, Pierce. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. And there are no consent items for personnel services, consent items, student support services. Oh, yeah, there's, we pulled uh, number two and three, so there are. Make a motion to take 26.1 uh, one, one, and then four, five, and six as a group. Second by Alvarez. One sec, I just gotta write this. Second, okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. And there are no consent items. Superintendent, 28, personnel actions. Certificated, Dr. May Bulmer. Uh, yes, I just wanna call out that on our certificated list this evening, there are four retirements culminating in 107 years of service. Pretty impressive. So thank you so much to those employees and congratulations to them. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation as listed? So moved, Alvarez. Is there a second? Second, Pierce. Any discussion? Calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5-0. Personnel actions classified, Dr. May Bulmer. Yes, we have two retirements this evening on our classified list for a total of 36 years. 
of service. So again, congratulations and thank you to those employees. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation is listed? Moved. Mr. Duran, a second? Alvarez. Thank you, any discussion? I just wanna to say to all of our retirees, um, as um, Gary Tomac used to say, you made it to the finish line. Congratulations and enjoy your retirement. Okay, any more discussion? Nope. Calls for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 5 0. And call out for closed session actions, Dr. May Bulmer. Uh, yes, we have two this evening. Uh, the first one is in closed session. The board approved the appointment of the following individuals Tammy Carley to the position of assistant principal at John Glenn Middle School. Gabriella Yamas to the position of coordinator for local control accountability, LCAP in other words, uh, and Paul Kraft to the position of principal for Earhart Elementary. This passed on a motion uh, by Trustee Alvarez, seconded by Trustee Duran, and it was a unanimous vote. Congratulations to those new employees in their new positions. Um, also this evening in closed session under item 3.5, the board took action on settlement claim number 21-L-012 on a motion made by Trustee Duran, seconded by Trustee Dr. Watson. The motion carried 5-0. Okay, suggestions for future agendas that receive at least three votes. Mr. Duran? No, I have nothing this evening. Okay. Dr. Watson? Ms. Pierce? Mr. Alvarez? And I have none. Announcements, the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education will be Tuesday, June 20th, 2023 in the District Education Center Boardroom, 47950 Dune Palms Road, La Quinta, California, 92253. There is no need for us to reconvene to close session. And this meeting is adjourned at 8.56. Be safe out there. <laughs>